Thanks, thank you. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, lovely to be here with you again tonight. Trust you've had a great day, and uh, yeah, time is drawing near, eh? The big day when you are released, released to go out and uh, do something marvelous for the Lord. You believe that, don't you? You do believe that you're going to go out there and do something great. Yeah, yeah. that's what God's preparing you for. We all right here? Okay. All right. I'll stay over this side then. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, so God is preparing, preparing you to go out. And um, I think that's just tremendous. Tremendous. Many have gone before you. And uh, uh, me for one, back in what was early 70s, I came through here. I was living in Indonesia at the time, came over here. Des was very compliant and helpful and uh, taking me in. A bit late, I arrived, about by two months, I think it was, but anyway. Um, so yeah, God has uh, sent many, many people, young men and young women, all over the world, different nationalities. And of course, this country is full of uh, pastors throughout this country who are uh, students, ex from uh, Faith Bible College, and so God has continued to use this and to use Des and Carly to head up the school, and guys have just done a marvelous job, an absolutely marvelous job. And uh, yeah, anyway, tonight I, I want to, uh, you know, our, our job here is to train you and to teach you at the school and to teach you the, the, uh, the, the, the great doctrines of the Bible, to give you a solid foundation, a good start in, in your Christian ministry. Also, our, our job is to prepare you, to prepare you to, to be able to uh, uh, unwrap the, the, the word, as it were, and apply it into your life and situations that you go through. And uh, so tonight, I, I, I want to do something very, very practical. I want to talk on, uh, on decision making. And uh, you're actually going to be going out very shortly, in fact, uh, uh, and leaving this hot house, as I call it, and you're going to be... Uh, heading out and you'll be making your own decisions. When you came into this school, you sort of forfeited that a bit because someone was making decisions for you. Yes, you had to be at the prayer meeting, you had to be at the class, you know, da 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 da. But now when you go out, you're gonna to have to make godly decisions. And uh, you know, that's decisions, decision making is important. It's linked to our faith and, uh, and so, God wants you to make the right decision. So he's given us a, a, a wonderful map in the scripture here to, to guide us through all of these things. And uh, you're here, of course, uh, because you made a decision somewhere down the track to come into Bible school to serve the Lord, etc. Uh, some of you might have uh, come uh, with a different motive, uh, you know, I have nothing else to do sort of thing, or I'll come here. But God has, while you've been here, God has given you purpose and turned you around. Turned you around. In fact, we sort of see this every year here. Some people come in, they weren't too sure what they could do, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I always remember when, <clears throat> uh, when I grew up in Indonesia, and, my, and the, uh, I've shared this with you before, my, my call, how the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I was about nine or ten. Didn't even know it was the Holy Spirit. You know, nine or ten-year-old boy, he just wants to run around, play, and sleep, and have fun. And... Uh, but I couldn't get this thought out of my mind. One day, you will be back in Indonesia. When I, you know, I was a young kid of nine, oh, I couldn't think of anything worse. <laughs> hated the place. My brother and I, we hated it. There were, there were eight of us, four boys and four girls, and my brother and myself, we're the oldest. And it, it was, Indonesia was, to put it politely, <laughs> close your ears, Jessica. <laughs> it was a dump. <laughs> it was a poor nation. Uh, it, it, we lived in... Squalid conditions, as it were. We had bad food. I remember breaking out on boils everywhere. It, it was a difficult place. And uh, so when we heard the news that we were going to leave, my brother and I, wow. Not the family, just my brother and I were going to leave and go back to overseas and, and to school. And uh, so that was, uh, so I knew I'd be going back to Indonesia uh, when I was about 17 or 18. I finally discovered that was God speaking to me. Yeah, he spoke to me. And that th those words never left me until the day that I finally returned back to Indonesia to work alongside of my mother after, me, after the death of my father. And, um, 
And uh, during that time, there were lots of decisions I had to make. Uh, decisions of, uh, you know, uh, finance, uh, decisions of how I'm going to get there, how am I going to get my visa, all sorts of things. And I want to tell you, the, the visa, trying to get that visa to stay long term, was the biggest, hardest job of the law. And I, I even threatened God. I said, Lord, you've called me out here. You know, we've all done those little silly little things. You know, and he just smiles at us. and He loves me all the same. Never changed one little bit. Just what a good loving father would do. And, um, and so, you know, all, all of these things happened. And, and uh, I end up in Singapore waiting over there for three months. I came back to New Zealand, went back out again. And, and in the end, I said, Lord, this is it. Not going to get this visa. I'm going home for good. And I, didn't, I think back now, and I, I imagine God the Father looking down. Well, we'll see about that, Harvey. We'll see about that. Anyway, I finally uh, came to terms with things. I never got that visa. Never. And that, to me, was something that I was going to get, regardless of whatever. I was going to get that thing. I just knew I was going to get it. So it shows you how wrong you can be. But it didn't stop God from getting me in there. And uh, he had other plans. Uh, my long-term visa wasn't important that I stayed there because when I, when I went over and did my teaching for seven and a half months, I would leave the country, come back to Australia, New Zealand, and other parts, raising finances for the school. That's what God wanted me to be. He didn't want me to be stuck over there at that time. So God has plans. So what I'm saying to you is expect the unexpected with God. Yes. And don't be so, so demanding like I was. You've got to give me that visa. I need that visa. God knows what he's doing, and when he sends you out, you'll be going out with his blessing, his wonderful love, and yeah, not everything works the way we expect it to work or want it to work, but God is working. God is working. So, making successful decisions. Practi practically everything in life that we do has decisions attached to it. And, uh, if you were born again and you're here tonight, you made a decision to come or vice versa, you didn't, you know, whatever the case may be, there's always decisions. And, and in every situation, decisions are important. Can I just say one or two things about decision making? Never make decisions, sort of knee-jerk decisions. Don't make that. Never make decisions when you're emotionally upset, you're going through difficult times, trials, etc. There was a young man in the, in, the, in the Bible that made a decision. His name was King David. David. He made a decision to, to go and kill a man because he would not give food to his servants. He was going to kill him and kill every male in that place. God, of course, sent a young woman. And that, one, that young woman was the grace of God to prevent David from... Because David was God's man to lead the nation of Israel. But he made a choice to go out there and kill. A wrong, a wrong decision. And uh, we all make wrong decisions. And you will make wrong decisions at times. But wrong decisions help us to grow and to learn. So just understand that. So um, let's see what the Bible has to say about decision making, making godly decisions. But before we do, remember every decision you make, you live with the blessing or consequences of that decision. You cannot blame anybody else you make the decision. And uh, that's important to remember because uh, there's great blessing and there are sometimes sad consequences in some of the things we do. So number one, I've got several points here. Number one, very simple, you know it, pray for guidance. Pray. Now you could, you could approach the whole thing of decision making another way. You could, you could uh, now what could I decide here? Is this going to offend God? Am I going to increase in my spirituality? You could ask yourself a lot of questions before you make a decision, and that's probably wise to do anyway. But pray for guidance. Proverbs 28, 26. Most of my, some, not the things, verses tonight come out of Proverbs. Proverbs 28, 26. He who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. Verse 25, 29 tells us, Walk to walk in wisdom, 29, chapter 29, 25. Walking in wisdom simply means to trusting the Lord. Okay? Why wouldn't you pray to a God who knows all things? Can you tell me why you wouldn't do that? A God who knows your future. A God who knows everything about 
the day you were born to the day you depart. Why wouldn't you pray? So it's important for us to understand these things. Prayer is extremely important in this area of decision making. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You know this one as well as anything. Trust in the Lord with all of thine heart and lean not what? On your own understanding. Why doesn't God want us leaning on our own understanding? Well, number one, your understanding can be totally wrong. Your understanding can be very biased, extremely biased, in fact, at times. So it's important for us to understand that. And of course, your understanding is extremely limited. You don't know what tomorrow brings. Okay? In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. I like the word direct. Make path straight and remove the obstacles and get you there. Isn't that incredible? God removes the obstacles. Removes the obstacles and makes sure you get to your destination. Only God can do that. It is not in man to direct his own footsteps. Man does not have the insight or the understanding to do that. Okay? So it's important that we understand these things. Sometimes we want things so badly, we interpret our own inner voice as the voice of God. We've all done it at times. Young man, young woman, we want someone so badly. Yes, it's the Lord. I know it's God. But Dad, it, it is God. Mom, I, I'm telling you, it's God. I just feel so right about it. And yet the parents, families, know something wrong here. But it's true. We want things so badly sometimes, we interpret our own inner voice as the voice of God. We move out, an area to be careful of. Verse 37, 23, 24, I just read that to you. The steps of a good man are ordered or established by God. He delights in our way, doesn't he? Okay? And even if you fall, he picks you up again, just like a natural dad would, fall off your bike, picks you up again, try again. Yeah, go off you go again. That's our Father. That's the way He operates with us. He loves us so much. So prayer is a key in making decisions, godly decisions. Even Jesus went away and prayed. One time He went up the mountain and He prayed. And the next morning He chose His disciples. What do you think He was praying about? Father, tell me. Remember, Jesus never acted independently of the Father. He never did anything outside of the will of the Father. No wonder he was so successful in his ministry. Everything he did was perfect because he had the mind of God the Father. So it's important for us to be praying. Jesus continually prayed. Always at prayer. Okay, second step. Get all the facts. Proverbs 13, 16. Every prudent... The word prudent means shrewd, wise. Every prudent man acts out of knowledge. He acts out of knowledge. He makes a decision out of knowledge. Get facts. In making major decisions, maybe marriage, maybe buying a car, maybe building a house, get all the information you can before you do anything. Um, some time ago, they were advertising, or a year or two or three ago, they were advertising stuff over in, uh, in, in Brisbane, over in the Gold Coast, uh, apartments over there. And, um, and, and they were doing very well at selling them because they were very, very attractive, price-wise. And, you know, right, nothing wrong with them. And uh, so they were advertising them as investments. So you could, you know, have it there when you wanted it. If not, well, you just lease it out and so forth uh, and so forth. And so people bought these things. Unfortunately, the problem was they had built so many of these apartments that they didn't lease out or rent out very easily. Someone went and bought one and complained that they couldn't rent it out to anybody. And they were hoping and they were relying on that rent to pay the mortgage. You need to have facts before you commit yourself 
Get all the facts you can. Understand what is happening in a situation. Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is a folly and a shame to him. Wow. Answers a matter before he has all the info, before he knows all the thing. Acts 15, chapter 6 to 21. There's a wonderful st uh, story there about the... Uh, uh, Jerusalem uh, Council. That was a council set up because of major problems that could have split the New Testament church, could have wiped it out, in fact. And uh, so uh, the different parties came down, Peter and Paul were there, and then the Judaizers were there presenting their case to James, uh, who was the, who was the uh, leader of the church in Jerusalem. And uh, eventually he, he goes uh, to the Bible and, and, and gets a, a scripture. Uh, and he was able to settle. But he got, he got all the facts. He heard from the Judaizers, he heard from Peter, he heard from Paul, and then he made a decision out of the Word of God. He got the facts, and he got it right. And it saved and helped to uh, uh, solve the problem and, of course, averted a major, major problem in the, in the church. Proverbs 23, 23. Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom instruction and knowledge, whatever it costs. Get the truth, get the knowledge, understand it, because it could save you a major, major problem later on. However, sometimes we don't have any facts to get. Many situations, there aren't any facts. In fact, I think of the, the children of Israel out in the middle of the desert. They simply had to trust God. And God puts us in positions like that where we totally have to trust Him. Now, all of us would say, yes, I trust God. But when you get put in a very difficult situation and you have to pray and maybe seek counsel, whatever it may be, it can be very, very difficult. It can be very, very difficult. There's a verse uh, in, in Psalm 37.5 It says this, Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. Commit your way unto the Lord. Okay? So it's important we get facts before we make major decisions. Step number three. Our decision-making should be aligned to biblical principles. We should never compromise the Word of God. Never. Joshua 1.8 says this, Meditate in it day and night, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. It's interesting, isn't it? Meditate in the Word. Let the, let, be in the Word continue. May the Word just be in your life. It's part of you. Uh, and meditate on these things. It will cause you to be prosperous, and it will make a way for you. Trusting and obeying God is paramount in the Christian walk. It always brings success. How do I know? God's Word promises that. God's Word promises it. Making decisions that compromise God's Word will bring disaster. Never override your convictions. Never override your mind. That which you have up there, that decision-making process. Don't override those things. Your conscience is the God's Word placed within you. In fact, that, that conscience that God has given you, no one, no one should override it. Okay? Your conscience is, is the one that tells you it's right or it's wrong. We know what is right and what is wrong because our conscience tells us these things. Okay, so that's important for us. So making decisions like that will cause you major problems. Daniel was a great example uh, of one that made decisions according to the knowledge of God's Word. Daniel 1.8. Now remember Daniel, he was taken captive and the Babylonians took him, they took him captive and uh, some of the young men, some of the bright young men and uh, the king wanted to use them for all sorts of things, become counselors and leaders and so forth and uh, so the king made sure that there's plenty of good food but Daniel, of course, the Israelites had a, had, had, had a, few, a food situation where they couldn't touch many things and uh, he being away, no one was around but he was determined to keep the word of the Lord of God. 
He was determined, even though there was no one around, he was outside his country, he was in a foreign place, he probably had a good excuse if he wanted to use an excuse, but he didn't do that. Daniel made a decision not to defile himself. Interesting, isn't it? Young man, he would not defile himself. And also, in Daniel 6.10, when they tried, uh, of course, the king had put him up into heights, he was uh, uh, one, of the, one of the leaders of the, of the kingdom, and uh, they decided, some of the men, they didn't like him, they decided uh, they would look for some dirt to, you know, like a, something they could find that would uh, get him out of the situation. And it says they could not find anything at fault with the man. Isn't that an incredible testimony? What an incredible testimony. They could not find anything wrong. So they decided to make something. So they wrote out a law. And of course, uh, the, the law then, the law of the Assyrians, it could not be changed. Once the needs, the law could not be changed. Once it was written, it was written. And so the law simply said that if he worshipped any, any, other, any other God apart from the king, he'd be thrown into the lion's den. And of course, the Bible tells us in chapter uh, 6, verses 10, he made a decision to keep on praying like he always has. Came home, threw his, threw his window open, and knelt down and began to pray to his God. And in came the man, we've got you, we've caught you. Took him back to the king. The king was very sorrowful because he had made this law. But he had to keep the law. So they had to put him in the lion's den. Of course, the Bible tells us that the king was so upset, he didn't sleep that night, and as the dawn broke, he ran down there, lifted the hatch. Daniel, has your Lord preserved you? And Daniel said, yes, yes, my Lord. My God has preserved me. He sent the angel to shut the mouths of the lion. Yeah. What an incredible story. Yeah. Now, he was in a life-threatening situation. He had to make a decision. His life was at stake, but his trust was in God. Sometimes, you know, in those sort of situations, we give God an opportunity to show off his power and his might. The decision you make might be an opportunity for our God to display his mighty power, like he did for Daniel. And, of course, we know the story. He was elevated. He would not compromise the word of God. Every decision he made would be in line of keeping God's word. And God prospered him and put him into a very, very wonderful place. So, decision making. You've got some decisions to make when you leave here. Many of you have. This is the time to start praying and start understanding. So by making godly decisions, Daniel allowed God to show off his wonderful power. Making decisions on your own understanding can be fatal. Ruth chapter 1, Eliamach and Ruth. There was a famine in the land of Israel, but over in Moab there was plenty of food. Now Israel, of course, always speaks to us of the presence of God. That's where God's presence was. So when they decided to leave, they could not trust God. They made a decision. They could not trust Him to provide, to provide them for food. So they moved, they moved away from the presence of God and went and lived in Moab, which was the enemy of God. It was like the world moving out of the, out of the church, out of the presence of God into the world. <clears throat> and of course, we know how fatal that was. Eliamak passed away and both their sons died. You see, decision-making will reveal your values. The decisions you make will reveal your values, what you stand for, what you believe, the convictions you have. And it's important because people can understand where you go and what you say, the people you mix with. They tell us a little bit about your values. What is important to you? What is not important to you? Okay, step number four. Don't be afraid to ask for Advice. That sounds pretty simple. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't. Having been a pastor for many years, people would come to me and they were already in the hole by this stage wanting me to help them. 
I asked them, why don't you seek advice? Why don't you go to somebody who knows or understands these things? Well, we thought we could do it ourselves. We thought we could save some money and da da da. Go and talk to people. Proverbs 24, 6. For by wise counsel, you will wage your own war. And in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 20, 18. Plans are established by counsel. By wise counsel, wage war. Get counsel. Go and talk to somebody. Talk to people who have been there. Talk to people who have done it. What is it that stops us from asking people? We all know it starts with P. Pride. Pride. Pride is a terrible thing, isn't it? Pride is, uh, it's insidious. It's like, a, it's like a cancer. Oftentimes we don't even know we have it. Others can see it, but we don't even know we've got it. Pride is a terrible thing. So pride will stop you from asking for help. One thing is for sure, we do need help because we don't know everything. Learn from the experience of others. Some ones have gone before you. People that have done it, people that are successful. You know, create that atmosphere for God to speak into your life. Allow the, the Spirit of God to, to move in the right atmosphere. Okay, one, uh, 1 Kings 20, verse 11. This is what it says. Let not him that girdeth on his armor boast himself as he that putteth it off. So it comes a man, he's been out in the war and he's taking off his armor. The other man hasn't even been to war, he's putting on his armor. Don't boast. You haven't been out there yet. You don't know what it's like. There, there, there's a thing. Here, learn from the guy that's been there. Okay? Let me read it to you again. Let not him that girdeth on his armor boast himself as he that put it off. Ask for advice. Get people to help you. People that have experience. People that have been there. People that have come back from the battle. That have been in battles. Scarred from battles. They know how to tell you. They know what to, to, to tell you to expect what you can go through. Very important. <clears throat> Jessica, I just want to say something to you too. Um, you're going to have some quite large decisions to make, but I want to say this to you. However it turns out, God's raising you up for missions. Missions. Missions is going to be, play a big part in your life. Okay? So however it pans out, however it works, that's the direction you're heading in. It was a bit like me going back into Indonesia. That was the direction. I didn't know how it was all going to work out. That's the direction you're going to go. Frank, I want to say this to you. You sometimes underestimate your ability. You underestimate the ability. The giftings that God has given you. So I think you need to be a little more serious about that, not just to push it aside. God has given you abilities. Step out. Be bold. Step out in faith. God's got great things for you. Mm. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying here? Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Mm. Okay. That's good. That's good. <clears throat> Decision making. How powerful it is. Okay. <clears throat> Step number five. Count the cost. Now Jesus talks about counting the cost in, in Luke 4. You know, a man doesn't start building a house and then runs out of money and a house is half done. Or a general doesn't uh, want to go out and fight an army of 20,000 when he has 10,000 himself. He counts the cost. Count the cost. Decision making is very important. Make sure you count the cost. What it's going to cost you. We talked about, uh, where was I talking yesterday, the other day? We talked about, um, was it in this class or the other class? We talked about counting the cost. Oh, it was in the class two, wasn't it? Counting the cost. Being committed, counting the cost. That there was a cost to pay. And Jesus said there was a very big cost to pay. If you want to be my disciple, you couldn't allow possessions, couldn't allow personal things, couldn't allow family to get in the way. Jesus had to be first. There was a cost. Some couldn't meet it. So I just want to say to you, when you work for the Lord, count the cost. Step five. This is a Proverbs 20:25. 20, it's out of the Living Bible. 
Proverbs 20, 25, it is foolish and rash to make a promise to the Lord before counting the costs. Hmm. Interesting. Do I need a new car? Honey, can't we get that house? I know it's 20,000 more, but can't we get that house? Count the cost. What do you mean by counting the cost? Well, can you afford to pay that mortgage? I think we can manage. Yeah, but what if you get sick and you have no insurance and you can't work? The car, why can't we get something a little bit that meets our needs? Well, we'd like the new one. Count the cost. There is a cost in decision making. Choosing things, you, you've got to understand that the family, decisions about the family, your marriage. Finances are a big thing in a marriage. Marriage is split up because of finances. Hmm? Amen? <laughs> that is true. So, you know, we need to understand and count the cost of these things, especially some of the big things that happen. That house, our budget could never afford that. That brand new car, we can't afford that. It'll put great strain on our marriage relationship. It'll put strain on the family. What about our son? He wants to go to university. We've got to, we, save, we need to save money. There's lots of things to consider. Lots of things to consider. And unfortunately, in these days in our world, there is something that is operating, and it's called greed. And it operates and consumes people. It consumes them. The rich young ruler came to Jesus, wanted to, how do I, how can I come into this wonderful kingdom? How can I come into this salvation? And Jesus right away knew what to say because he knew the blockage in that man's heart because he was a very wealthy young man. And he said, go and sell all that you have. Well, that was just too much. That cost was too much for him. He couldn't do that. He didn't want to do that. And so, yeah, he moved on. Making more money, is that going to make you happier? I had a guy in the church uh, some years ago come to me, and he, <clears throat> he said, um, uh, and at the particular time, he had a young family, and he had a couple of teenage girls, one of them of which was causing him a problem. And uh, he came to me, and he said, oh, he said, um, I'm heading off to the UK in a, in a, a few months' time. And uh, this is the time when the, uh, let me see, this is going back a few years, this is from the time when the computer programmers and analysts were making heaps of money. I think it might have been coming up. Yeah. Anyway, he said, I'll only be going for six months, but I'll be making huge money. I think he's going to make about 4,000 New Zealand dollars a week or something, or a month or whatever. I can't remember. And um, so he said to me, uh, he was just telling me. He wasn't asking me anything. And I said to him, I said, are, are you sure that's the right decision to make, knowing his situation? What do you mean? Well, with so-and-so, your daughter. Well, you know, wife's here and so you, you, I said, you're the father, you're the head of the home. She, she needs you at this time. You need to be there. Fortunately, he listened to me and he didn't go. But you see, money could have destroyed that marriage, could have lost that daughter. And, and I, I could tell you so many stories like that in, in church situations where people make decisions. Like I can remember a, a guy came to me and said, well, look, we're moving out of the church and we're going to go down. They haven't come to ask me about it. They're just telling me about it. We're going to move down to Wellington. I've got a job down there. Things are looking good for us and so forth. And I really felt uneasy about the whole thing. And I said to him, I said, you know, I'm sorry, but I, I, just, can't, I just can't sort of confirm that to you. I, I feel uneasy about it. And that was the end of the matter. He, he was, and uh, anyway, um, this family went. And uh, eight years later, they came back. And one of the first things, when I saw him, one of the first things he said to me, he said, you are very right, he said, about feeling uneasy. Lost my daughter to something, some other, some, uh, second daughter, something happened to her. The, the whole thing just fell apart down there. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so, you know, get advice, have counsel, count the cost before you begin to do things. And uh, make the proper decisions. And ask questions. 
I had, I had a girl come to me she, uh, in the UK when I was pastoring there, and she said to me, uh, Pastor, I'm going to join the army. And I said, the army? Oh. Okay, I said, okay. And, uh, and she said, I'm looking, I'm quite excited about this. Uh, and uh, what do you think? And I just, I, I, I believe the Holy Spirit just gave me these words. He said, well, well, can I just ask you one question? Do you think joining the army will draw you closer to God or push you away from God? I really felt that was, a, that was a word of wisdom. Um, about four days later, she came to me. She said, when you said that, I went home and I couldn't sleep that night. I couldn't sleep. And I realized that was true. The army with its drinking and all the stuff. Uh, and so I, I've actually canceled. I'm not going. Asking for advice is very important. Count the cost before you do things. So decision making. The right decision, decision making, it reflects your values. Decision making will determine your destiny. Great. Incredible, isn't it? I've already determined my de destiny. I've made a decision to follow Jesus. My destiny is secure. And so is yours, if you have made that decision. And I think it's very important for us to understand. Genesis 25, 29 to 34 is a wonderful story. It's a story of two young brothers, two brothers, Esau and Jacob. It's a story of a young man who was governed by his senses, by his drives. He was the oldest, Esau. He had the birthright. The birthright was a spiritual blessing from God. But because he came home hungry one day, he made a decision to release his birthright. Young ladies, young men, listen to what I'm saying here. Just for a moment, to eat a meal, he released his spiritual birthright. So many of our young people in churches today, just for a night of pleasure, they've released their spiritual birthright. Be careful. The Bible calls him a profane man. Esau was a profane man. God did not like him because he did not honor God nor honor the blessings that he had. So you've got to be sure. There's another man in the Bible, Genesis 19. Lot. His name was Lot. His uncle Abraham, whom the land was promised to, said to his brother because of the continuous fighting amongst the, the, their herders, their sheep herders and cattle, cattle men. Look, he said, we've got to move on uh, because there's so many of us. God's blessed us so greatly. He said, why don't you choose? Here's, uh, here's Abraham. The promise was made to Abraham. Abraham was the man that was going to be blessed with all this land, but he was happy to release to his nephew. You choose first. So Lot went out and he looked at all that great plain that led up to Sodom and Gomorrah, beautiful, rich, alluvial soil. And he took that. He made a decision based on his own desire, his own want. Never thought of his uncle. He made a wrong decision because we see him pitching his tent, then we see him pitching his tents towards Sodom, then we see he's living in Sodom, and then we see him at the gate of Sodom, involved in the city of Sodom. He lost his wife. And two of his daughters produced Moab and Ammon, the two enemies of God. He lost everything because of a wrong decision, a greedy decision. Make sure that your motives are right before you make decisions. Make sure that you are not doing something that's going to do, displease God before you make a decision. My way, I just want to just stand up for a sec. <clears throat> I just want to say to you that God has marked you out. That's the word I marked you out. You've been marked out even way back, way back long time, you have been marked out. You've been taught, brought up in a place. I don't know your background. You've been brought up. You've been taught the Word of God. God has set you aside for Himself. My son, listen to me. 
Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt know my blessing upon your life. As you walk before me, as you keep your eye focused on me, I will bless thee. For indeed, that was a set way back in eternity past, my son, that to bless you and to make every word that you speak, man and woman would fall before the living God because God's going to empower you with his spirit, saith the Lord. You're going to speak to many people, not only teach them, but you're going to uh, indeed speak the word of God. The kingdom of God is going to flow out of you. And you're going to put these hands, you're going to perform many, many things going to happen. Man, a man of God. So walk, walk circumspectly. Work, walk, trust God in all these areas. Keep on searching out for God, okay? Because God's got his plan, hand on you in a great way. How does that sound? Have you heard that before? <laughs> okay. But you have heard about being yeah. set aside. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Bless you. Jesus. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, just as I finish here, <clears throat> step number six, make a decision. Make a decision. Proverbs 16.3, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Make the decision. Every decision has a risk, a certain risk attached to it. Faith is risky. Faith is risky. You can do what you can do and what you can't do, God will do. Remember, faith is active. It's a verb, it's an action word. You do what you can do, and what you can't do, God does. I meet so many people that say to me, oh, I'm just waiting on God. Yeah, but what are you doing? Well, I'm just, just when he wants me, he's going to come and get me. It'll all happen. No, it won't. I had a friend in Wellington, <clears throat> wanted to go to the mission field, said the same thing for year after year. Never went to the mission field. In fact, he's passed on now. We've got to step out. We've got to make the first move. You do what you can do. God will do the rest. Stepping out is saying, God, I believe you. I'm right with you. I know you're going to help me. It's going to happen. And you're going to step out. All of you are going to be moving out in the next few days. And as you get out there, some of you are going to have to make decisions. Some of you don't like to make decisions. We like to procrastinate. We like to put them aside. Well, I made some decisions before and, and, and I got them wrong and, and you're scared to make decisions. God is with you. God has encouraged you. Make decisions. Decisions and faith are linked. So step out. Do something. Well, what if I fail? Well, what if you fail? Start again. Do again. I fail lots of times. I can remember getting up to give my first prophecy. And I got up there and, uh, well, before I actually got up there uh, and I did it, my hands were sweaty, my mouth was, it was white, uh, you know, frothy, and, and I, I couldn't speak. And, and then someone gets up and, and, and prophesies out the back, and I thought, oh, very similar to what I had. <laughs> I said, next time I'm going to do it. Next time came around a few weeks later, same thing. Heart was pounding. Mouth was so rude, hands were sticky. I didn't do it. I chickened out again. Someone got up and said the same thing. And I felt God say to me, Son, I'm with you. And I, I believe God showed me that by those two words that what I had was right. And so I started. And I remember the first time I got up, I, I stuttered and I stammered and hardly came out. I felt so embarrassed. But yes, that's a start. Everybody has a start. It's, it's first the natural, then the spiritual. You had to learn to walk in the natural, you have to learn to walk in the spiritual. You had to learn to trust in the natural, you had to learn to trust in the spiritual. You didn't just arrive out of mum's womb and says, Hi, mum, here I am. You had to learn. Everything is learning. And you make mistakes. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. That's how we learn. When I touched the heater, like many of you have done here, I learned never to touch it again. <laughs> I know, you learn hard work, but that's, that's life, isn't it? That's life. And so I'm encouraging you, as you step out of this place, don't be afraid to make decisions. Yeah. 
Oh, that's right, just come on up here. Just come up here. That's good. See? Yeah, just stand out here. Yeah. There you are. <laughs> Father, I just thank you for this man. Thank you for the call of God on his life. And Lord, I just thank you for the fire that is burning within him. Lord, a flame, a ball of flame that's burning inside of him. Lord, can't wait to get out to begin to use what he knows and understands. Lord, I just pray your blessings upon him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For I'm raising you up, saith the Lord, that you will return to your nation and you will indeed see great and mighty things happen. In fact, the Lord will use you in a mighty way and then take you to many other places to testify and to talk about what God is doing in your land, what God has done through you. For my son, I am with you to bless you, to anoint you, to see uh, mountains fall before you, saith the Lord. For I will use you in a wonderful way. Walk before me in a humble way, my son, and you will be blessed abundantly. Amen. 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 Bless you. Okay. Well, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Des. I just, well, shall I just close and pray here, Des? Or do you want to say something? No, you go right ahead, Okay. We're going to go ahead and have a fellowship over here? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. Anything else you want to say? I just wonder if there might be anybody else that would just like... If anyone wants prayer, I'll be here. Okay. So if you don't want prayer, just go over there, and we'll be over there to join you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the word of truth. Thank you, Lord, that your word is powerful. Lord, it guides and leads us. It heals us. It blesses us. It transforms us. And so, Lord, tonight I just pray, Father, for impartation by the Spirit of God into every young person's life tonight. And, Lord, as they begin to go out of this place in the next couple of weeks, Lord, I just thank you that you have gone before them. Your presence has gone before them to prepare and so, Lord, I just pray your blessings upon each one of them, Lord, those that may not even know where they're going, what they're going to do. Father, let the peace of God just rule and reign in their life. For, Lord, you are in control of every situation. So, Lord, we just bless them and encourage them in your name. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat> <clears throat>